Welcome to Four Kids Flashback. Hello and welcome to Four Kids Flashback. I am Tara Sands, joined by my co-host Steve Yurko. I didn't get to say my name this time. <laughs> I know I was thinking that. I was like I was like I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to say Steve Yurko and see what he does. And that's what you did. And I got offended. You did? <laughs> did you get yeah, really? <gasps> Joined by my co-host. Uh, say it. Steve, you're duh, oh. <laughs> oh. Oh nah. man. You'll just do it next time. I'm just oh, going to well. cut that. That was weird. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm no, just kidding. Uh uh yeah, we did a bit. Yeah. Um I'm so 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 excited for our guest today. Uh We'll talk about him in one minute. Let's get like the nonsense out of the way so we don't forget. Uh, um, you can. Uh, oh, you know what you guys should do before you listen to this? You should uh, subscribe, rate, review our podcast on like Apple Podcasts or yeah. wherever you listen, and then share it with a friend because that's how we get to keep doing the show. Mm-hmm. Gotta get the word out here. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Oh, they can also go to a very special site called. Uh, Starts with, flash- oh, Starts with a P. Oh. Starts with a P. Four kids. Four, uh, it, it, four kids flashback spelled P H O U R. No. Um, <laughs> Patreon.com slash four kids flashback spelled with a number four, not with mm-hmm. the word four. But if you go there and if you like our show that much and you want to hear more a week early, ad free, subscribe to us on Patreon. Become a patron. And, You'd uh, be a patron of the arts. Yes. Because is- <laughs> anime is an art form, so there you go. And, and, um, and what could be a higher uh, work of art than a podcast? It's the highest art form, <laughs> I think. I I'm putting so that on a t-shirt. <laughs> um, I I have to say before our guest gets here, and I won't. I'm not going to tease it with too much stuff, but it finding Waldo Cabrera for this interview. <laughs> Just finding him himself, and I'm not going to make a Where's Waldo joke. because I, I was wondering if you're teeing no, this up. because I'm, I'm not. Like, no, no, I'm, like, I'm really not. I'm like, she knows, right? She knows. No, she... no, I'm not doing that. I knew, and then I saw your face. I was like, he thinks of, no. I, I, so in finding guests for this show, I obviously started with the people I knew, and then I started doing deep dives in on LinkedIn or on the on the web. And what I've tried to do, hopefully I've done an okay job, is find people from different departments at Four Kids. And I I didn't know people in in a lot of the departments. So when I found Waldo on LinkedIn, we started writing, and I saw that he worked in the home video department. And I asked him about something very specific that we will get into on the show, and he responded with. Oh, that was my idea. And I felt like a friggin' detective reporter extraordinaire. I mu- I probably yelped out loud because it was like I understood what people on crime podcasts feel like when they solve something. I was like, we found the guy. And you're going to have to just listen to the interview to find out what we're talking about. But uh, if I could drop any hint. I'm very excited to hear what they have to say about this. So, yeah, if you've been if you if you've been listening to us for a while, you might know, or if this might be your first episode, uh, uh, you're in for a treat. And then go back and listen to more episodes. That's yeah, exactly. you should definitely should do that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and it's a it's this. We're hoping he answers a question that not only Steve and I have, uh, but that we've been asked by fans to find out about. So, um, it has to do with home video. Uh, but he worked at a few different departments, um, which makes for an even more interesting uh, interview. So sit back and relax, and here's Waldo. I, I shouldn't have done it like that, but here's Waldo. Mr. Cabrera. Our guest today is Waldo Cabrera. He started working at Leisure Concepts, Inc., which became Four Kids. He started working there in 1993. I believe he's our first guest who actually started at Leisure Concepts. So I'm very excited to talk to him. He then moved on to be a creative director at Four Kids and then became the VP of Home Video. He is a two-time Emmy winner. and We are so excited to have Waldo Cabrera with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Can we talk? I know you're you're a New Yorker. Is that I have that right? Okay. Yes. Yes. And you're still a New Yorker. I know you're working in 
New York television right now, right? Yep, uh, I'm on Long Island right now, but I but the, my heart is always in New York City. Yeah, and that's, that's where the money's I, at. It's well, you got to work there at least at the beginning to establish yourself. It kind of feels like, and then you can move to the the boroughs. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. other boroughs. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about your art background and what got you working in this area in the first place before we get into the four kids of it all. Were you always an artist? We, you know, our co-host Steve is a very established artist as well, so he'll probably have better art questions than I will. But um, when did this all start for you? Well, I was definitely the uh, the class artist, and um, I went to the High School of Art and Design on 57th Street and 2nd Avenue. So, um, you know, at 13 years old, I was, I was, uh, I knew that I wanted to do art and in particular advertising. And, oh. um, it was just one of those things where I, I, um, I didn't want to be a starving artist. I knew that when I was 12. <laughs> so how did you know that at 12? Like did, did someone say to you, this isn't a career? Like how did that thought even enter your 12 year old brain? Well, in New York, we have specialized high schools. So when right. you're 12 years old, you have to decide what high school you're going to go to. And, you know, if you have um, the fame school, uh, if, you, mm -hmm. if you're a performing artist, um, they also have the High School of Music and Art, which is the fame school. And then the high, there's the High School of Art and Design. So as an artist, those were your two big choices. Those are, that's the pinnacle right. of high school as a creative. And um, one teaches you how to be a museum artist, you know, the next Van Gogh, the next Degas. Okay. Uh, and that would be the, the High School of Music and Art. And uh, the High School of Art and Design teaches you how to be a graphic designer, an architect, a, a package designer, cartoonist. Oh. Um, you know, uh, and we, we, we were doing, you know, everything that you and I are involved in, you know, the, the world right. of making money out of your creativity, as opposed to Wait until you die to be famous. Well, I was just going to say yeah. the other is clearly the starving artist school. Like, yeah, that's so that's fascinating. I mean, I remember here because LaGuardia was the performing arts school. And I just remember I'm from New Jersey and thinking, I wish I had New York residents so I could go to LaGuardia. So I'm so envious that you got to go to a, a, such a specialized high school. And so that's a, the wonderful thing about going to a high school like that is that everybody is in is creative. Our, our school had a uh, 2000 kids and every single person in that building was creative. So, you know, we all had wow. our creativity in different in different areas, um, fashion design, uh, package design, illustration. Uh, but let me tell you, um, when you see somebody who's who's your best friend really kill it, you know, make a painting that's you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. they just did that. Wow. You got to up your game. You got to up your game. And, and you know, we we sort of um, we inspired each other. It wasn't a negative a competition, but it was more we inspired each other. So a lot of great people uh, have come out of the High School of Art and Design. A lot of great I artists. Bet. Steve, are you so jealous right now of his high school I mean, experience? I don't know. Like, I was like, I, I, I think I had like three questions lined up for you, and you just answered them all as you went on. Like, that's that's so fascinating. Like, knowing what you wanted to do so early, and having like a very like, like mature outlook on it, thinking like I should get into advertising because you know I'll make a living doing it, you know, and I won't <laughs> starve. And and <laughs> but I, I was curious what the environment is like too, because you said like two thousand kids. Like for me, like I really didn't, I wasn't in like an art centric school till college. And it was kind of like, I, I, I think it, you know, just, you know, uh, the detriment of just going to public school, one thing was like being a big fish in a small pond. So it was kind of like a rude awakening. But I eventually, I, 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 I don't, I don't even know if like the school, <laughs> it's wanted this out of us, but we kind of formed a community where we all kind of built each right. other up instead of competing with each other. And I'm not sure if the school's like, no, you're supposed to compete. And we're like, no, we're all trying to make each <laughs> other great. Um, no, nah, it was just nice. It was nice to hear that you're you got all those experiences at a much younger age. So by the time, yeah, like at college age, you're well, you know, you're well. Yeah, did you even need to prepared. go to school, yeah. or did yeah. you have the training necessary to just start a career at that age? I had the training necessary to go straight to an ad agency uh, mm -hmm. because it's it's a vocational school. That's uh, that's yeah. What, so it was back, you know, not the old days, but, you know, back then the, mm -hmm. the goal was to have you career ready right out of uh, right out of high school. 
And and we did definitely have the skill set to go into one of the big ad agencies if we wanted to. But, um, you know, uh, this, you know, going, going into the work, into starting your career at 18 was not any in any of our minds. So uh, <laughs> right. I, I went to Syracuse University, uh, you know, mm, okay. uh, studied broadcast over there and advertising and broadcasting. So what what happened at Syracuse is that I was just way ahead of everybody else. Yeah. You know, I'm, I was in a freshman year, first semester, freshman year. I was, I was horrible to be around because we're, <laughs> we're doing figure drawing and these people are struggling with uh, getting the head in proportion with the body. And I'm like, I, I was doing multiple <laughs> figures on one 18 by 36 page because I was bored. <laughs> Yeah. Right. You could have taught the class. Yeah. I've been doing this since I was 14. I'm like, oh, guys, you got to challenge me with something else. Yeah, I remember seeing you know? that with, yeah, like uh, there was a classmate of mine who came in and quickly, yeah, and then all of a sudden he was gone. And that was, yep. So I think some of the teachers like, you don't need to pay for school here. Well, it's like, <laughs> we'll put in some connections for you, you'll get a job. And I, and I was like, damn, the world is a lot bigger than I realized. But at least I, I, I will say like, at least, even though I went to public school, we had a great art program and i it was a similar thing for me my freshman year of college like they're teaching us like photoshop and all that i'm like yeah i know this already you know it's like, <laughs> so yeah. did you stay all four years you were i'm guessing it was new house then if it's syracuse right that's the right. broadcasting and right so so i i studied advertising at the high school of art and design and i realized i was just good at it i enjoyed it because mm-hmm. advertising i'm i'm a i'm a person that's uh always curious and when you have to advertise, whether it's a, you know, whether, whether it's Pokemon or whether it's a pair of shoes, uh, you really have to dig into it. You have to understand the, the product. And I enjoyed that. So I pursued it in, in, co- in, in college. And um, what I loved about Syracuse was that Newhouse and the School of Visual Performing Arts, they shared the advertising program. So Newhouse showed you the business of advertising. So all mm-hmm. the copywriters, all the business execs, if you want to like run an ad agency, you, you'd be a new house. Wow. But if you were to going to be the creative guy who's coming up with the, you know, with the, doing the Photoshop and the graphics and, you know, and, and even the, the photographer, if you're, if you were creatively, visually creative, then you would be a VPA, but they cross pollinated the two programs. So, um, I'm, a lot of my time was spent in new house and mm-hmm. just as much was spent in uh, VPA visual and performing arts. So you actually did stay the whole time. Yeah, even yeah. You, okay, so you stayed. I, I'm one of the lucky guys that I, I, I um that I knew what I wanted going in. I graduated with that, and I had a career in that. I'm I think I'm like maybe five percent of humanity that does that because look, listen, you're you're 18 years old. What do you know? I mean, do you really understand what life has in store for you? And it's really difficult. I'm just one of the lucky ones that I knew what I wanted. Yeah, I mean, I always, I, I'm always so envious of. I, I was the same way. I've been doing voiceover since I was 16, but I felt sorry for the kids who didn't know. And I loved that European kids were taking a gap year to figure it out. Like, no kid should be forced to decide this stuff at such a young age. But- yeah, you know, it's it was just I was just fortunate, and what I the way I tell people that I did it is I enjoyed it. So I kept doing what I liked, um, and and uh, and I just uh, I, I just fell into money <laughs> because yeah. I just kept doing it's a what job. I liked. Yeah. yeah, is there a style that you specialize in in terms of of that stuff? Do you, or is it across the board? Or I don't. I, don't, I mean, I'm kind of ignorant about this stuff. You guys are understand this much more than I do. Well, advertising requires that you um, that you just uh, you, you're able to understand a complicated matter. And then put it simplify it. So mm-hmm. I I pride myself in being able to to talk to scientists, talk to tech people, and then translate it to regular people talk. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Which is know. what the what like I'm coming from. I'm like what make the art. Like I again, I'm a layperson when it comes to this kind of stuff. So I might ask you to explain more stuff because I assume that our audience also doesn't know the details about how this works. Yeah. So okay. You graduate Syracuse, woohoo! Graduation party. How fast are you in the ad agency? Ah, oh, it, it must have been a week and a half. Oh my god! Because I, I got, 
No, <laughs> I, before before I got my my diploma, I received a bill from my from uh, the my loan officer. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I better get a job. Okay. So I was like, oh, I can't. No, I better go get a job. You know? Yeah. So it was. Um, I I got uh, just to, just to give you a little bit more context. I was also a programming geek. I love computers. Oh. I used, I had a Commodore Big Twenty. I had a, I had a, a, you know, then a Commodore sixty four. This is I used early to, days. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I used to, I used to mimic all the video games. So I would see Miss Pac Man, and I would go and and just reprogram Miss Pac Man. Um, and what? and you know, and then we used to, we used to crack, and we used to buy the program, and we used to crack into it. And then when it says uh, one up and two up, like player one, we, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll put my name in there, Wall, and my brother will put his name Leo, and then. When you get eaten, it tells you, you know, like um, whatever. It gives you a message. We would put insults in there. So I used to crack. So I was obsessed with video games. I was obsessed with video games at the at the level where I knew how they were done. I mean, and and I wanted to be a gamer. I wanted to be a, a, not a gamer, a, a programmer. And um, uh, I just I just lo- I liked advertising much more. So then when I graduate, I I, I went into the entertainment industry instantly. It was a small uh, company called Ericsson Baslow Advertising, and um, and I was just an assistant there. Became a, a, a an art director, mm-hmm. um, and the my the person uh, the person that was really my in in charge of me, she got hired by Leisure Concepts. Okay. So she comes in and she says, uh, "Hey, Waldo, I'm leaving," and I go, "Oh, so that's, does that mean I get does it mean <laughs> I get your job?" You know, and she's like, well, I got uh, an idea. Why don't you come with me? And I go, well, you know, why would I go with you? I got, you know, I'm (laughs) I'm getting a promotion. (laughs) That's it. She goes, well, you know, take a look at all uh, these clients. You know, I was working with Orion Pictures. I was working with Turner Home Entertainment and a lot of television stuff. So it was fun. Mm -hmm. But then when I saw Nintendo, I'm like, pow, say no more. Right. Okay. (laughs) So, okay, Say no so more. N- this is like around 93. So LCI, which is Leisure Concepts, they at that point, they must have had, I'm going to say, Nintendo, like Cabbage Patch Kids and wrestling stuff. Is that sort of what was going on there at the time? Since I knew you were going to ask that question, I pulled oh, up. Oh, he's looking I for have, something. I have my, uh, wow. my uh, annual reports that I designed. Oh, my gosh. I have okay. the annual report. So the annual report from 1995, I believe, is wow. here. So let me tell you who we okay. had. Okay, since this is an audio podcast, describe to these people what we are looking at. So uh, uh, Leisure Concepts was a publicly traded company. And every every year, um, we had to release an annual report for people to, you know, to, for the investors to understand what we're doing, what we did, and where we're going. And, um, and we used to put together this fancy... Uh, uh, 16 page, sometimes 32 page document that would talk about all the exciting properties we represent. And then at the end, it would give you all the numbers, you know, uh, profit right. and loss. And this blah, is all blah, blah, public blah. information. So yeah. we're not, yeah, we're not disclosing anything. <laughs> wow. Oh color. my gosh. Okay. We're looking at James okay. Bond. You know what, guys? Bond. We're going to make sure that we have something to go along with when his interview comes out so you can see these visuals because you should not miss this. Yeah. So so we have uh, here in uh, 95, we had James Bond. We had Nintendo. There's there's a Super Mario, Nintendo. There's Bowser wow. in there. And then that's when uh, Mario 64 came out. And... So at this point, we should explain, too. So So it was not yet called for kids. They were not producing things. They were just handling the licensing for these properties, which you can explain what that means to our listeners. Well, well, the one thing that I want all the listeners to understand is that all of this is driven by licensing. Four kids productions, um, four kids uh, would not exist if it wasn't be- because of licensing. So the business of licensing for um, just a, a, a quick overview is if I have the character Nintendo, um, I know how to make Nintendo games, but I don't know how to make t-shirts. I don't know how to make hats, uh, backpacks and all that stuff. So Leisure Concepts had all the contacts with the manufacturers. So we would make an exclusive deal with them, whether we rep- you know, we represented Nintendo in North America and in Europe. So that means that we had the exclusive rights to, to pedal um, right. that. And, uh, and we'll, we would make deals. And me as an art, uh, as a, the art director, in order to make the, the the approval process 
go faster, I would create what's called a Bible. And then this Bible had um, color, uh, color palettes that you can use, um, designs that were ready that there's just copy and paste. You just slap it on your shirt and you can start selling the shirt. So right. it, this is to expedite the, uh, the approval process. So, um, and, and we would do this for 18 to 20 properties at the same time. Wow. So we had well, cabbage patch Let's also remind yeah. these young listeners that they were not emailing these designs. There were bike messengers and FedEx yeah. and... <laughs> so, so, that's, uh, so that's what we did. And, and the thing about um, Leisure Concepts is that we, we were the, the, the largest independent uh, licensing company in the world at the time. Um, wow. independent, meaning that, you know, Disney is not necessarily independent. They're attached to a studio. And if you, if you pick up a property for representation, um, the manufacturers want to know, do you have television? So okay. television was always a driver. So, uh, although we were able to make some things really popular without television, it started becoming evident that the good, uh, uh, the highest, uh, you're going to get a lot more sales. And, and a lot more profits if the property is on TV. So that's when things started getting interesting. And then that's really what caused the decline of 4Kids Entertainment. Okay, so you were working, I guess, for Al Khan at this point. My man, Al Khan. Did he, is he here, did he do your like initial interview or was your boss able to just bring you along without that whole process? It, it was kind of like just I rolled up honestly it was no <laughs> <laughs> see you were the uptown you were the uptown people to us like we did not interact we were just the actors like we heard there was an uptown office I had no idea all this stuff was going on over there yeah so, so it's so cool to, to talk talk to someone from the uptown office <laughs> that's right the uptown office no so I just I just walked in I just walked in and you know basically I was blessed in by by my uh by her name is Susan Simpson Okay. Uh, so Susan Simpson just blessed me in. I had, I really didn't have an interview with anybody. Um, you know, they trusted her fully that I was the, I was a good right hand person for her. So she was the creative director and I was the art director and, uh, and, and Nintendo was really the driver of leisure concepts at, at that time. Wow. And Cabbage Patch Kids, I guess it, what, that wasn't the heyday of Cabbage Patch Kids, but it was still a big deal. And then, mm -hmm. And then I, I know around the mid nineties was when they did their first television venture into something that had to do with wrestling. So I assume you were a part of that. <laughs> oh, I have the laughing. picture right here. I have the oh picture right here. It's okay. called, Ma it's called, uh, here we go. Yeah. It's called mm -hmm. Dragon Masters. <laughs> no, WMAC Masters. It's yeah. WMAC Masters. That's what yeah. it is. Right. So, so that, that, that happened. Um, we, we represented WWF. And WWF oh, right. uh, they, they got got into um, some controversy um, with New York State because they called themselves uh, real wrestlers and real athletes. <laughs> so New York State uh, requires that real athletes get get um, tested. And these oh. guys, they weren't going to pass any test. No, nope. <laughs> <Nope. laughs> no, not going to happen. And yeah. eventually there were there were some uh, there was some court uh, issues where Hulk Hogan testified against Vince McMahon. Oh, the, and the when that happened, scandal. yeah, remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then, I, I could tell then you all those guys that. jumped over to WCW. But we were making so much money over off of uh, w, uh, WWF. And we had all these licensees that dropped the property the minute that scandal dropped. They were like, no, you oh, can have this right. thing back. You can have it back. So we, oh, it, Al Khan was obsessed with trying to figure out how to replace that WWF magic. So he came up with WMAC Masters. Oh, they, him, uh, him, Norman, <laughs> mm -hmm. Norman, uh, Norman Grossfeld. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's so, when he entered the company. So, yeah. Okay. So as, I mean, as somebody who wanted to work in all this, this must have been an ex this is an exciting time to be at this company because it's expanding quickly. I mean, this is pre Pokemon, which is insane to think about. Um, what was your job on all that stuff? My job was to make up the rules. Just make like, up the rules. In what way? <laughs> it's, it's like I'm t it is so funny. <laughs> we would just make up the rules, you know. Like for so we would get a property, and um, 
And, you know, sometimes something like Nintendo, the characters will be fleshed out and Nintendo will give us the backstory. But something like WMAC Masters, we'll be like, eh, we just make it up. And then we'll put it on a Bible. We're like, oh, the, you know, this guy, we just make up their backstory. We, this, he, he's a, a four-time gold medalist and, you know, and, and this is his superpower. It, it's, it, that's what I love. That's why I went into advertising because you get to make up stuff, you put it out there, and then, you know, the crowd either likes it or they don't, you know, if you, if you do it in a nice creative way. It's That's fun. Also, see, I didn't know necessarily what an art director's job was. So you're answering a ton of my questions now. Like, I didn't know that you'd get to get into that much depth or, or would they just say to you, hey, draw this up? Like, because as a lay, again, as a layman, I didn't know that you got access to all to do all this stuff. It's awesome. Well, it was a team effort. Right. So, so you have your marketing people. It's a team effort. And then in the end, we had to visualize it. So we, you know, we, we had a, a, a toy development department, R&D department that would uh, come up with toys. We had Norman coming up with uh, TV ideas. Uh, you know, the WMAC Masters, you know, uh, I, I was the art director behind that. Mm-hmm. I was the art director. I was the, the art director for the Yu-Gi-Oh! logo. I know. Um, I def- yeah. We're going to get into that. I'm so excited to hear that. So story. we would visualize all the ideas, but, but, you know, it was a lot of back and forth. So, you know, and, and, and none of these ideas really is you know, one person can hang their hat on. You, you right. all had, you know, a little something to do with it. But it, it's, it's, it's like, it's really exciting. It's so much fun, especially yeah. as a kid. You know, I was like 25, 26 years old, you know, That's killing amazing. it. That's amazing. So, okay, so yeah. it's the late 90s. <laughs> You're in New York City. And so this is, again, they're starting to make the transition into television, but I'm I'm assuming Al Khan or some, somebody like that says, we acquired something called Pokemon. Do you know yeah. anything about anime? Like, what's your reaction to this? <laughs> oh, you should have seen the look on the face of people when they... <laughs> 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 we, 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 we had a, a policy where when a, a new property would be acquired, the the entire office will go into the conference room and we would view it and everybody's uh you know oh, no. we, we would chime in so they play the first episode one of pokemon and we're, and we're sitting there like, like what's happening right now were there even <laughs> subtitles or was were you just even watching the japanese with no subtitles at that point I, mean, I you know it, it's such a all i remember is pika pika bulbasaur charizard <laughs> or whatever it was i think it I wasn't think... dubbed yet yeah it, it was just like, what is happening? And it was slow and none of us got it. And uh, so we started to vote on it. Al Khan says, Adam, you don't have to vote. We're taking it. Because <laughs> he knew because he knew the numbers in Japan. Yeah. He, well, he's well, a the numbers rumor, guy. Yeah. Let me tell you this rumor. I don't I don't think that he had a, a ton of faith in it either. But the, he passed on uh, the purple dinosaur. He passed on Barney. Barney. He OK. Yeah. So he that wasn't going to let that happen again. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, Norman yeah. Norman told us that Pokemon just almost didn't happen. Like, no one wanted it. No. But I think he and Al were, were just like, this is, we are doing this. <laughs> and this also would have been, like, post the, the big seizure in the episode with the epileptic seizures. So, so to see, let me give you a little, I have to, I have to go into the corporate structure of the company. Mm-hmm. So, Great. So, for kids entertainment, uh, leisure concepts, realizing that only uh, television drives properties. You're not gonna make money if your thing is, if you're not on TV. So we started um, a, a TV production department in order to be able to have access to television. Right. And then we had Summit Media, which placed, uh, uh, who sold advertising against, against the TV shows. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, well, and then we have 4Kids Production. So at that time, when, Pokemon had the problem with the, the one episode with the seizures. None of none of the studios wanted it. Right. So we we went to them and we said, well, you know, we can we can put you on TV, but it'll be syndicated television. You're not going to get national, but we're very good at syndicating. We had already we had already mm-hmm. syndicated a ton of shows, and that's how we were keeping the machine going. Okay, so Summit had syndicated. Summit was the one. Syndicated Summit Media. Those shows? Yeah. Okay. So. Was Some that was a division of Leisure Concepts. Is that yeah. correct? Okay, I want to make we sure were under, that we're explaining the company structure. Yeah, we were technically technically called a vertically integrated company. Okay, that, that's on our on our annual report, meaning that you know <laughs> we, we were self sufficient. 
we would be able to go go fish for the property, produce it, and we would um, uh, uh, syndicate it, and we would sell advertising against it. So every opportunity to profit from from any one property, we we no one was allowed in. We wholly controlled it. Was there anything comparable to that at the time? Because even Disney outsources their licensing. I mean, from what yeah. I understand, if they want to make a backpack, they license a backpack company to put Mickey Mouse on it. So was there anybody, was there a company that Al and Norman wanted to be like? Uh, well, we, 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 we our licensing is uh, by definition uh, uh, outsourcing, but I don't know of any other company that was vertically integrated where, where they were getting the property, they were producing it, they were syndicating it and they were selling advertising against it. And we also had an international, we had four, uh, we had leisure concepts oh, right. international. And then we were also managing international rights ourselves. So there was no third party in, in oh, London. Wow. We had a London office. We had one in France. We had one, we had an, uh, uh, an office in Australia. So we, we were managing it all. Yeah, I don't want people to lose sight of how big they were thinking, like with yeah. all this stuff. Like this was thinking big. <laughs> so the table was set. See, see, if all of that was done and the table was set for Pokemon. That's why I wanted to make sure that folks understand the corporate structure. This wasn't, it was almost by design that Pokemon came to us by mistake. <laughs> right, they, but they were ready when it happened. Right, yeah. so Pokemon yeah. couldn't get placed. So we told them, hey, we can produce the show for you. We can Americanize it, which is a, a big thing with, uh, with the Otakus. Yeah. We can yeah. Americanize it. We can license it. We can uh, syndicate it. We can sell ads against it. And we can manage it internationally. Let us take it all. So we got worldwide licensing rights everywhere but in Japan. We, right. The world. And, and, not, and they didn't have the, the two things they didn't have licensing rights for were the video games and the cards themselves. Is that... Right. Right. OK. So the, but but Norman had said that, like, those were the huge money makers. So they had to figure out even more ways because they didn't ha they weren't in charge of the cards, which could have been a windfall. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the, the cards, the cards were a driver, you know, the cards made things happen. So I really I really wasn't that concerned. I mean, I don't think four kids really wanted that because the dri the cards required a science. You know, you really needed to know how to make those things. I think we I think we were in the right place at the right time and we yeah, were fine I mean, without it, the cards. Listen, it all worked out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, OK, so you see this ridiculous show because that's how I felt the first time I saw it. And I'm so glad you did mention the otakus because we will get into that and the issues they had with what we what not us specifically, but what what happened with the show. Um, so you see this show. And then what is your first assignment when all this stuff is coming in? Like, well, are you still maintaining your other full-time stuff with the Nintendo licensing and Cabbage Patch Kids and all that? It was it was uncontrollable. It was <laughs> I, it, it, I I cannot tell you how uncontrollable it was. It was we had a, a, a small crew. Uh, uh, our art department was maybe five or six people, and the approvals are coming in. And so somebody would make um, a, a, a toothbrush. So that toothbrush, we needed to review it, look at it, make comments. If we don't like it, we send it back. If we like it, we send it to Japan and, and the, all the paperwork. And then it was just piling up and piling up. And, and, you know, so Susan says to me, we need more help, right? I, I, I come, my family, I must have like, like 59 to 100 cousins. <laughs> and all of them lived in the Bronx and, and most of them were unemployed. <laughs> so I would call on my cousins. Oh my gosh. I'm like, I'm like, hey, dude, man, you know, we need help in the art department, right? So they would come in. And then a week later, Susan's like, no, we need more help. And then they, Okay, mother, wait. Were they qualified to do this or was well, it jobs that they could learn on the job? It's, it's paper pushing because the approvals were coming in. I mean, Pokemon was just so hot. And our job in the art department was to, you know, approve these these pieces. And, and you know, and just the paperwork, just there was so okay. much documentation. Yeah. And then imagine, just like like Amazon, you got to package it, you got to put, you got to uh, wrap it, you got to, you know. Right. It was just so it's much. It's logistics. It's more than anything. Yeah. Else, more than artist artistic stuff at this point. It's logistics, I it, would guess. Right. There was not enough hands. There was not enough okay. hands. And there was a joke uh, at one point. Al Khan, when he would walk around the office, he would ask people, "So who do you know? Oh, I know Waldo. I know Waldo." <laughs> so everybody he would he didn't recognize that he seen. <laughs> 
<laughs> he's like, they're related to Waldo. So at one point he goes, uh, we're going to change the name of four kids to the 40 Cabreras. <laughs> Oh, that might have to be the title I, oh, for the yeah. episode. The 40 Cabreras. The 40 that's, Cabreras. That is so great. I love that. So so that's my that 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 was in terms of just physical logistics. Um, but in terms of what we had to do, it my task was to explain Pokemon. Because okay. our licensees didn't understand it. They were like, right. there was happening? a learning curve at that point, right? And 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 I would I I, I was flown out to um, I remember uh, uh, greeting what is it American Greetings or the competition to Hallmark um, Oh American Greeting Company Yeah American I Greeting they're they're, they're like in Ohio that. they flew me out so I can have a conversation with their entire art department to dis- to discuss Pokemon like this is what happens this is what the characters do and just just give them a you know like a, a like a a, a a mental download so that their creative team can go ahead and start creating everything that American Greeting right. does. Because they just didn't get it, and it was my job to get it, and and I, I would I would be flown all over the place to to talk to other creatives about you know this is what you can do with this property. I love that. Now, did you have any anime experience in your youth, at, or I, I knew like Speed Racer, and that oh, was man. it. Come on, I, was, high know. school of art and design, and I don't know anime. You got to be kidding. Me. <laughs> okay, there. See, but you're one of the you are one of the only people we've spoken to who knew anything about it then yeah, you know I mean? yeah. which is great which is why we're so excited to talk to you so what was your did you like it did you not like it did you <laughs> all, all i ever wanted to do was draw anime i mean i i would you know i there's just a special art and just the the action and everything about anime i wanted to be one of those guys that that drew my own comic book and and have okay. a, a, my own manga you know yeah see you but see you even knew the word manga I mean, which is, again, puts you leagues yeah. ahead of so many of the folks we've spoken to. But unfortunately, you weren't the one making the big decisions, like, again, the Americanization of it. And and did you have any strong opinions on how they were changing it? Or did you think this is how an American audience will accept it more if we do make these changes? Well, listen, I'm going to go on record okay, by saying that Pokemon would never end Yu-Gi-Oh!, would never be Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh if four kids had not Americanized it. Right. End it of story. Have... Okay. It, there's no way. There's no way that the cutting edge um, uh, subject matter that 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 occurs in in in, in standard anime it, they just would not resonate because our our target audience was kids six to eleven. That's who we were selling to. Mm-hmm. The stuff in its original form did not sell and it was not appropriate for kids six to 11. Right. When they get older, that's maybe when they would have understood some of those deeper concepts that Yu-Gi-Oh especially had going on. Yeah. But but the fact that that. the fact that we were also the the um, when we made deals overseas and we sold Pokemon in Italy and and in France, they took the US version and dubbed it. They they mm-hmm. could have easily taken the Japanese version and dubbed it, but they didn't. So right. it, because they knew that what we did was already already got the stamp of approval, and that's what made the the, the show popular in the first place. They weren't going to mess with the formula. Right. You, it was supposed should, to yeah. feel like you like the show was made for you wherever you lived in the world. And that's sort right. of the opposite of what hardcore anime fans want. So it's so you, they're setting themselves up for it for a tricky situation, which yeah. leads to which we're going to get into your job in home video and what you some decisions you made. But let's OK, let's not get ahead of ourselves. So in around 97, the company changes names to Four Kids Entertainment. So you're you get new business cards, obviously, because that's yeah. the most fun part of having a job. Um, did you, you stayed in the Uptown office though. Is that correct? We always stayed in the Uptown office. We just kept buying, we just kept taking over floors. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but same on 23rd street, they just yeah. kept getting, you know, we'd walk in and they'd be busting down a wall. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh, oh, okay. I guess they own we, that we building. Took, yeah. We were on the yeah. sixth floor. Then we take the fifth floor. Then we take the seventh floor. Then we're like, we need another building. And it's like, I'm telling you, it was insane. So your job describes that's it was it was a crazy time to I mean and a fun time to watch mm-hmm. a company explode because I don't know when I'll ever be part of watching something like that again. Yeah. But your job changes to creative director in '97. Is that sound? Yeah. Correct? 
See, the, what, I, what I really, um, I got to give a lot of credit to Alcon and, and to the people at the, um, at, you know, at the leadership. They hired from within. Um, the, the, things were happening so fast. And the Cabreras, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> they hired the Cabreras. No, but they hired from within. You know, when they needed talent, they always looked within. And I was always one of those people that I, I stayed at the top of the bubble. I was, you know, I didn't get consumed by this expansion bubble. I was always on top. So even though I had a advertising and, and creative background, I, you know, I was business savvy. So, so um, I said to them, hey, I want this opportunity. And, and to their credit, I don't know what they saw in me, but they, they obviously saw that I can manage it. Mm -hmm. And it was out of my comfort zone, but I felt that I can definitely do it. And um, so, so, and they felt comfortable also working from within. So whatever I didn't know, they knew me, they knew who I was and they knew my work ethic. So whatever had to be learned, I could learn it on the job. Yeah. And, and, uh, and they did that with more than one person. So, yeah. so that's how yeah. I managed In to get to. In both offices. Yeah. yeah, you're so right about that. They, I mean, so many people that we've spoken to also, they've just, they've met and liked and were like, you'll figure it out. We like you and we think you're good. I mean, Sean Conrad was one person. He was an engineer there who just yep. took on more and more responsibility. And a lot of people, this was, you know, their very first job and they took chances on mm -hmm just word of mouth or whoever their teacher was at NYU. And so I love hearing that. I mean, it's, yeah. and the fun is seeing what all those people are doing today. They're winning Emmys, obviously. Um, <laughs> yay. yay. So, okay. So as creative director, how does your job change? Does, or does it, does it not really, or does it? Well, I always tell creative people, you got to be careful what you wish for, right? You always want to be the boss. And then you end up doing, you do, you end up doing less of what you'd like to do. Mm-hmm. Right. So I was the art director and I was, you know, I was drawing, I was coming up with crazy ideas. I was coming, you know, meeting with the creatives. And then as a creative director, you just watch other people do the stuff that you like doing. But, you know, there was yeah. like seven or eight artists. So I'm overseeing, the, you know, seven or eight artists. And then I'm also You're delegating. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's how my life changed in that sense, where it was more um, keeping the general creative focus of four kids entertainment but um you know these kids you know they had to crank it out and at that time which was interesting the the computer was just becoming more prevalent so mm -hmm. it would it would irk me to no end when people would not sketch first i i'm like I'm like, why are you, you know, they, they were showing me all these ideas that they would do and illustrate. And I'm like, well, where are your sketches? Oh, the, here they are. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And I, I, I was, I'm like, I want to see what your brain has. I want to see what your, your creative juices. I want to see what you can put on paper with a pencil. I, you know, if you go straight to Illustrator, all you're going to do is show me what you know how to do with that program. Right. I was you know? going to say, for the people at home, Illustrator is a computer program that I, that I guess some of those people were, I mean, Steve, you must have learned on a computer in college. Mm -hmm. he, went yeah. to, he went to design school and that's how they learned. I mean, it, that's not how my brain works. No, I wanted to see sketches. I wanted to see sketches yeah. and I would be on them. People sketch first, sketch first. Come show me some paper, show me some, some ink. And then you can go to the computer and they would, they, they dislike me, but now they call me, they say thanks. <laughs> well, I get that. I mean, I, I learned how to edit audio with a razor blade and I know that's impractical, but I'm glad I did that because it's the tediousness of it that sort of makes you understand what the computer does faster. But I mm -hmm. liked having that base of knowledge. And you I know, like making like, the computer. I like ma the, making the computer do what I want it to do, as opposed to me doing what the computer allows me to do. It's it's a different right. different creativity. Mm -hmm. Right. You weren't saying it as a dinosaur who was not ready for computers. You understood computers. You were saying this is a better process as an artist. Yeah. Right. I, I'm if saying I want to see what's in your head. Yeah. I, no, I'm, I'm I'm a computer geek. Yeah. <laughs> which no. makes it under like which makes it. I think palatable for those people who think, oh, he's just older than us and doesn't, but no, that's not what it was. That's so no. interesting. No, I just want to see what's in your brain. That's, a, that, I, that's what I want to see. Um, and, and what's in your brain, you know, uh, if, if you're sitting there with a mouse and you're sitting uh, uh, polygons and 
You know, it's, it's not what's in your brain. I just mm-hmm. want to see what's in your brain. So how did the Yu-Gi-Oh! logo happen? So tell us that story. <laughs> so so um, we tried so hard um, to, to get a Pokemon logo. Uh, our, we had everybody on the team just coming up with Pokemon logos. And, you know, it was swinging and miss, swinging and miss. And we just never nailed it. And eventually, um, Nintendo sent us, sent us the current Pokemon, uh, yeah, Pokemon logo. And I vowed, I'm like, man, if we get another chance, we're going to get it. We're going to, we're going to get it right. But I wasn't the, you know, so I was the creative director and I'm sitting there and I'm like, we're going to get Yu-Gi-Oh! We're going to do it. And, um, and they said, well, you got to do it in like a week and a half. You got to come up with this logo because, (sighs) because Konami is going to press and they need a logo. They're gonna. They're go, they're going to press with the cards. And and it was like it, I was made to believe. I'm not sure if it's true. I was made to believe that it was a hard date. Like they are going to press. They need a right. logo. And um and, and I was stretched out. Were you the only ones working on the logo, or were there other teams that they were looking at who might be designing a logo, or was it you guys or nothing? I th- yeah, I think it was us. Okay. Yeah, I think it was us. I don't. I don't remember seeing uh, any artwork coming in from anybody else. Okay, so you had to make yeah. this happen. So, so, so you get out. I mean, are you drawing at this point now? Can you get back on the drawing side of things? Oh man, I got. I have sketches. I, I found them. <gasps> as a matter of fact, I have all oh, these. We need all of this. Oh. <laughs> I, I have. I have the sketches. I have the sketches for for Yu Gi Oh, and um and you know so they they told us look Yu Gi Oh. It's, it's, it's similar to Pokemon, but it's scarier. You know, it's a, it has a, a, a sharper edge. And once, once um, they were done, Norman and his team were done describing Yu-Gi-Oh to me, I, um, the, the vision that came to mind was the Nightmare Before Christmas, oh. uh, you know, uh, with, with a yeah, jack-o'-lantern. Yeah, of course. And there's, if you take a look at the poster of the Nightmare Before Christmas, I love that font. So I, I wanted Yu-Gi-Oh to be in that font. Now, if you, if you pull up the poster, Nightmare Before Christmas, and you put Yu-Gi-Oh right next to it, it's the same font designer who did it. Wow. He was in California. I called him. We hired him. I paid him a ton, a ton of cash. But he had to do it over the weekend. And he, wow. and he did the Yu-Gi-Oh logo for, for us. And I said, I, wanted, I want that Nightmare Before Christmas font. And he gave it to us. That was over the weekend. So on Sunday, I gave it to him on Friday. Sunday, he faxed it to me. I was going to ask how he got it to you. Okay. Okay, children, a fax machine was used. Do you understand how ridiculous this is? Okay. And it probably wasn't even in color. No, no, no. It was was a pencil sketch. It was a pencil sketch. (laughs) So we we faxed it to me, and then we we selected it. We're like, that's the one. I love it. I love it. And then uh, the, um, the, the, the client in Japan says, we don't want it to just say Yu-Gi-Oh. We want some kanji in the background. And and I'm saying... I don't know how to write kanji. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? So, and you're, so wait, so you're also faxing it to Japan. So yeah. that's so oh, yeah. this is the process. I just this is insane. Okay. We faxed it and they like they approved it, but they wanted kanji. They wanted the Yu-Gi-Oh in kanji in the background. And I'm like, how am I gonna visualize this? I don't know kanji. So my stomach was in knots and I didn't know what to do. And on 56th Street between 6th and 5th Avenue, there's a ton of Japanese restaurants. It's a, a, a mm-hmm. it's just a bunch of them. And, and that's where I go when I'm stressed out. I eat sushi because it's easy for my stomach to digest. <laughs> that makes sense. I walk in and I'm, I'm just like, I can't. I'm like, I don't know how this is going to happen. And I sit down and I pick up the menu and half the menu is in kanji. The, the other half, handwritten kanji. Oh, you're in the right place. And the, the other right half time. was in English. So I call up. I'm like, hey, who wrote this? And they go, oh, it was. <laughs> The dude that rolls, the guy that's sitting there, he goes, well, I wrote that. So I'm like, listen, if I come back, what time do you close? Four o'clock. If I come at 4.05 with a bunch of, of paper and ink and some brushes, can you write Yu-Gi-Oh? <laughs> he goes, ah, no problem. Right? So, so when they close. You better closed, have given him the best tip for that lunch. <laughs> So yeah, so so I I, I came back with a, with a bunch of newsprint and we laid it out on the floor. We had the floor covered, and he had this big brush and he's doing Yu Gi Oh, right? He's writing Yu Gi Oh a bunch of wow. times, and then the hostess goes, "Ah, that's 
that, that doesn't look that good. Here, give me that. And she writes Yu-Gi-Oh a bunch of times. Wow. And then this dude from the back, uh, like one of the chefs comes in. He goes, what's going on here? Ah, you guys don't know how to do this, you know? And he writes Yu-Gi-Oh. So I had a, about four or five people in there just writing Yu-Gi-Oh. And I, I was in heaven. So wow. I had the ink dripping run over two blocks to, to, to uh, 58th and 6th. And we hang this up on the wall, plaster the walls. And we picked a U, a G, and an O from different. But so to this day, I don't know which one of those guys actually has the kanji. Right, right. Because wow, they, this is insane. Yeah. And then, and then I scanned it in Photoshop. We outlined it, dropped it in, you know, and, and they loved it. <laughs> oh, my. What an that is an amazing story. And I'm even looking at like I'm, you know, and this isn't the official stuff. This is stuff you find online. But I even like I'm looking up the Nightmare Before Christmas font at the moment, and yeah, you know, I'm just and I'm like seeing the similarities. Like you, you changed it up yeah. from there. I'm guessing like you took it, did or did well. Yeah, I and the actual font designer did the Yu-Gi-Oh. I told I asked him to do it because that's what you do as a creative director, right? Yeah. You tell somebody, and then you allow the artist to do what the artist does. But mm -hmm. I told him with the specific, I needed to look like. A nightmare before Christmas. Because I, yeah, I no, it's funny because I'm also like I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you both, and also I'm looking back and forth, and I'm like looking at the two logos and comparing them, and I'm like I'm seeing the similarities. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, and I'm like that the lowercase H is is is, is basically the same H, yeah. So it's the lowercase I. Um, yeah, I'm having fun with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no, I have so okay. I could do another hour on just this sushi restaurant and knowing if did these guys did you ever go back in and show it to them or was it better for them not to know what they had worked on? <laughs> I, I I am ashamed to say that I never went. I went back and ate a bunch of times. Okay, um, but because I, they but knew I, the word Yu-Gi-Oh. They I mean they must have at some point the show must have come on and they're like that's the the thing that's what we did. <laughs> I have no follow up on that. I'm so sorry to say. No, it's kind of funnier that you don't. I think actually, <laughs> I just hope you left a big tip. That's all. <laughs> yeah. No. Hey, listen. But you know, it just it just shows the madness of you know, like I like I said before, we were just making stuff up. Yeah. We because we had it. to. Yeah. Well, and you know? it also speaks to, to the New York of it all. Um, mm -hmm. And and we we get into this with a lot of people. We spoke to Brenda about this. And all. There, that the fact that you could leave. And walk with it within three blocks, get any type of food you wanted, whether it be Japanese, Turkish or whatever, you know, it's New York. Yeah. And that's the magic of doing that show in that city and working at four kids in that city. Yeah, it was it's just it's a, it's, it was fascinating times. But that that logo, that logo. Um, and then and look. We delivered, and like four days later, the cards went to print. <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> it was mad. It was crazy. <laughs> I'm trying to picture the cards. Too. Yeah, I, I, now I have to. I'm going to do a deep dive after this. But that is what a wild story. So uh, okay, he's getting. I'm digging into my drawer else. here. I love this. Oh, okay. oh wow! Oh yeah, so. There's the logo. Well, that's okay. So he, what he's showing us is obviously the not the card that was used on the show. Mm. It's the real card that people play with. But yeah. now, did you know at this point that they were going to have to change the back of those cards in the shows themselves because of the kid vid rules and the rules about not advertising to children? Uh, I did not know that, but I was aware of it. Um, you know, but it, it, no matter what we came up with, they were going to have to change them. You know? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's it's you don't want to be advertising directly to kids and things. That, uh, but Norman did some magic with that rotoscope. <laughs> yes, Norman he did. scene. Norman yeah, scene. Yeah. 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 Amazing. And th we've spoken about some of the guys. I mean, literally, there was one guy who was just taking out cleavage all through Yu Gi Oh. Like that was his job. Yeah. <laughs> and, and um, our our target audience is kids six to eleven. We don't yeah. want we don't want to be well, showing that, too much and that's cleavage. That's just it. So okay. So I we before I. There's a, a bunch of stuff I definitely want to talk about. You, you at one point, I guess we made some uh, a video for you that you brought to a school. Oh my god! Tell us about this. So I'm a Bronx boy, right? I grew up in the Bronx. I, uh, you know, educated it um, in the Bronx, and uh, somebody got wind that I was the creative, the art director, and 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 at the time the creative director for the for the company that brought Pokemon to the U.S. And this was the hottest thing that existed in, 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 on Earth. So yeah. they wanted me to be the um, the keynote speaker at for a sixth grade graduation, 
And I was nervous. I'm like, me, a keynote speaker? I'm just, for me, I'm just a guy who loves to draw. And I'm just, you know, I'm not a keynote speaker kind of guy. Aww. Um, and I said, well, so who was the keynote speaker the year before? And it was this guy that used to, that was a, t- a national TV star called Malik Yoba. He was also okay. a Bronx boy. Well, look, look him up, up Malik too. Yoba. Okay. So I'm like, wait a minute. I got to follow Malik Yoba? You can, you're kidding me. I, you know, how do I do this? So I said, you know what? What I, what I wanted to do, I said, all right, I'm going to see if I can get permission to get some of the voiceover artists to go with me to the graduation. And then maybe they, you know, they can talk. So I talked to Norman about it. He goes, eh, you're going to ruin the magic. Uh, seeing and, seeing yeah. the actors and not just the voice. Yeah, he yeah. said, no, no, you're going to yeah. ruin the magic. So I said, no. So uh, w- w- can, can we do a video? What if we do a video for the kids? He says, yeah, you know what? We can do this for you. Um, we could just, uh, we could do a congratulatory video for the kids and we'll have all the voiceover actors read the names of, of every child. So I said, you know what, Norman, thanks. <laughs> So I got the list of every kid that graduated. I handed it over to Norman and you and and all of your voiceover people did. Um, oh, my God. It was <laughs> incredible. It was like, Waldo, congratulations, Waldo Cabrera, Johnny Chu, Billy Madison, you know. And, but in the voices of their fa- of Ash yeah. and Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, I would have gone crazy if the Smurf said read my name at graduation. Yeah. So yeah. so he cut in everybody. He had he had a. Uh, um, uh, the Ninja Turtles. He had Pokemon. He had Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, uh, he, wow. I, I, he, he had a Kanikuman. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Ultimate, Ultimate Muscle. Muscle. Ultimate yeah, Muscle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's, he had everybody in there. And then, uh, and the punchline was at the end. Uh, uh, Yami Yugu says, hey, uh, "Okay, kids, it's time for school." <laughs> Oh, it's so okay. Do you have this anywhere? I need to, you do. Oh, yeah. you're set. Wow. I'm gonna make you send me everything you have at some point, or I'm just gonna pay to have it all photocopied and digitized or whatever it has There's to be. Like, no way that would happen today. That is so, yeah, I don't know. That's so, no, cool. Listen, so cool. It's I gotta, I gotta say, uh, that's the relationship that we had. I mean, Norman did not have to do that, right? And and do right. you realize the time that he took away from you in our busy schedule? The right. amount of episodes we were cranking out. I mean, f- 54 <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh's, another 56 Pokemon. Uh, and he's taking the time out to read a bunch of kids' names. I mean, you know, sometimes amazing. it just, it, it, sometimes it brings me to tears to think yeah. about that he gave so much and mm-hmm. the, the, the kids lost their minds. They just, they lost their minds. They couldn't believe that Yu-Gi-Oh and, and Pikachu and Ash <laughs> Ketchum was saying their names. It's It's so cool, too, because, you know, and you you know this, like there was no Twitter or social media like we we never had ways of knowing how kids felt about this stuff. So for you to get to see that is so special because, listen, I and I again, I'm a broken record, but I I go to these conventions and I get thanked for my time there. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not me. You should thank it's it's you. And it's these people behind the scenes that did all this work and the and Norman doing those little things like that, that made a difference. So on their behalf, you know, thank you. And I hope you do get to experience a convention like this. Okay, but we we can't keep you forever. But we need to talk about the home video department. Because <laughs> when I asked you about the uncut versions of Shaman King and Yu-Gi-Oh, you said, oh, that was my idea. Yeah. And I lost my shit because I was like, this is the guy. This is the guy. And we get asked about this constantly. The fans are, well, first, they're so appreciative that there was an attempt to make an uncut version, but then they're so pissed off because there's not enough of them. So what, how, give us, the, just tell us everything you can that you remember. Obviously, it was a million years ago. We were getting a lot of pressure from, from the hardcore um, anime fans that, that, you know, and we were just getting beaten up uh, uh, publicity-wise for that four kids is the, the end of anime, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> that we, we, were some, we were somehow, you know, the, the evil anime people. And it's right. like, you know, from a business standpoint, if you're running a business, you you understand what we did, you know. And if you don't understand what we did, you don't understand business. So, but mm-hmm. respecting, you know, what was going on, um, my job as as a uh, as a head of a home video is to try to figure out what can we put out there that's going to sell, you know. 
So I, I I put it out there, and it was you know it took a while for people to warm up to it. I put it out there. I said, hey, why don't we do a, a, an uncut version? And they were like, oh, four kids entertainment, you know? I was like, <laughs> I mean, we're a kids company, and you know it, it. I can't remember exactly how it was pushed through, but um, you know my argument was they they want it, and and um, and some Steve people. Was, Steve was that kid, like yeah. He, he has these he's gonna get, show you he was one of the okay so he was one of the kids on the message boards yeah. he was complaining on the message boards that he wanted real anime so i mean i am just so impressed that you because they had a real artist there again there were other yeah. real artists but you understood this in a way that i think so many other people there didn't so but i must say hero to the otaku of the four no, i must say I, I i am an unwilling hero to the otaku because i wasn't doing it for the um the purity of of anime you do it for I was commerce do, it was a business it was a business <laughs> yeah, decision it was commerce yeah it was it was something that we knew there was a demand for but the truth is that we didn't know how much of a demand because you can have a very vocal minority and mm -hmm. then if you if you follow these people that just are peppering you, peppering you, and then you go through all the expenses of, I mean, you you had to revoice it, right? Yeah. It had to be yeah. re-edited. I mean, there was there was there were yeah. hundreds or, or tens of thousands of dollars that had to be put behind all of this, and then we had to package it. Then we had to you know uh, press the DVDs. We had to distribute it. There was so much money that goes behind. And then what if it's just like ten people who are really good at being loud? <laughs> <laughs> you're so right oh my god you know? yeah i can't help but ask i'm like so was that like probably around there was that estimate around the number of people actually bought these dvds <laughs> it, it, it definitely wasn't the hit that the others were mm. but we yeah. put it out there we we, we put it yeah. out there because we felt that it was it was enough of a demand that we should at least listen and and i i respected that much mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i mean look you can't be in the business of of commerce and have somebody clamoring for a product and then you don't give it to them. Um, and I think in my, in the back of my head, I was sort of saying, well, you know, maybe we could, you know, shake off this reputation that, that we're getting on the, on the bulletin boards, but you know, you can never make them happy anyway. Um, and our business model is kids six to 11. The reason Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh were a worldwide phenomenon selling over $20 billion of merchandise is because kids six to 11. Right. And yeah, I mean, I'd like, they probably intended if, if it was successful, they would have made all the episodes. When people ask us, why didn't they make more? I say, listen, I don't know, but I assume money. I can tell you why, like, it didn't sell. Mm. Yeah, it didn't sell. I mean, that's it. Like money yeah. was the bottom line. There was another question. Well, no, about, I can I can I correct you on that? Oh, I don't yeah, want it. I don't absolutely. want it to be money is the bottom line. It's just that, okay. you know, you you have to be careful what you wish for on the other side too. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna put out an a APB, <laughs> an all points bulletin mm -hmm. on on getting getting this out, when it goes out, buy it, support it, and if this goes for everything, it goes for any product that you want. You have to put your money where your mouth is. Otherwise, you're just not gonna get more of it. Because no, no, no company is in the business of losing money. Right. And if we saw that there was a mass, you know, response, we would have definitely put out more. But you're not going to put, you know, to sell 5,000 units, you're like, eh, you know, I'm going to try to sell 10,000 yeah. of the, you know, the edited stuff. It's, or the, it's the classic phrase. You got to put your money where your mouth is. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I, at least coming, you know, at least allow me to like, you know, speak you know where i was coming from at the time like yeah you know it's like uh i i i grew up with pokemon and i got older and i'm like well i'm like i don't want to see these anime americanized and then when four kids and that's like we're doing this and i'm it was almost like holy shit they're doing this and <laughs> i the Yu-Gi-Oh ones took me a while to acquire but i remember going in on like a friday evening fye and i'm picking up the two shaman king dvds and it's I and, and yeah like I I can only assume that it was just like it is as you said like I think not enough people actually bought them and then you know and the whole, and their the whole series is being redubbed um and but yeah it's I but I just want I want some people at least there to know I'm like hey 
I, I, I showed up for We him. were listening. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, we were listening. I, I must say that we were definitely listening. I was listening. But um, when Al Khan sees the numbers, yeah. he's like, I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not listening. Uh, no, you know, it's, if, you, if, it's, if it's not a successful venture, you can't follow up on it. it it's difficult. You can't make mm-hmm. a case for it. And so that's the only reason why not many more were made. You know, I mean, uh, Tara, you know, you know the investment to put in something like that. Oh, and, yeah, and the you're time, only money, like a tenth every, of that. Resources, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a fan question that I don't know if this was before your time working in home video, but you, do you remember Pokemon Live, the live <laughs> musical <laughs> show? <laughs> yeah, I remember. I saw the rehearsals. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so there was a, a professional video made. And there were even pro, there were promos made saying it was coming to home video. Like they, I saw the, the the video recently where it says coming soon. Now, the one of the fans asked, why didn't it go? Now, is it the same kind of reason? There just wasn't the demand for this Pokemon Live show. <laughs> Pokemon Live was a is an animal. It, it, we yeah. it, it played at uh, uh, Radio, Radio City. City Radio City Music Hall. I was there. Oh yeah, Radio City Music Hall. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I cannot say that I know the answers, um, but. You know, uh, we can only suspect that maybe Pokemon Live wasn't the hit that we wanted it to be. Yeah. So why put why put it on video? Well, and the the unfortunate thing is that that professional there's a un, non professional video that is online, but that professional video that they did put a lot of money into, Norman said is lost. Like no one knows where that recording is. Like it would be fun to have it now. There's the, it would see, be, that's it would the be nostalgia fun. factor of it is so is what's fun. Yeah. Um, when you worked in the home video department, uh, I know you also worked on the websites for certain shows, which I do want to talk about. But let's fi- let's wrap up your home video time until 2004. What other stuff were you doing in that department? Well, I, I never worked on the website stuff. I worked, uh, I, you know, in conjunction with the creative folks on the website. So, me, oh, I, I, I okay. yeah. But, you know, uh, look, we our, our job was to monetize uh, the TV shows, right? So I, I would come up with the groupings of the episodes. Um, we would work with, uh, with um, the uh, Four Kids Productions on DVD extras. Uh, those oh. were the most fun. All the DVD extras yeah. that you go in there and they would come up with, I mean, there were so many goofy things that you guys would come up with. That was hysterical. <laughs> but uh, it, it was, the question was, why would we want to buy a DVD of a show that's on air every day of the week? You know? Right. So we would put in a lot of little, little things like the DVD extras. And, you know, sometimes we would, um, uh, well, I mean, honestly, the only, the only difference was the DVD extras and the fact that you get to, you get to own it. But I had a lot of fun doing that. You could watch it whenever you wanted. I mean, this is pre DVR. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So that's it. So you were there until 2004. Uh, What was your decision to leave like? Did you did you just want to try something new, or did they say get the hell out of here? No, 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 no. no. It was my decision. My son was born. Um, well, look, you know what, uh, there, there, there was a few factors. I mean, first and foremost, my son was born in January, 2004. And, um, and so I live on Long Island and my commute was two hours in, two hours out. And as a creative guy, you, uh, you know, and I was uh, at the, now at the, in the leadership role, you're not a nine to fiver. So mm-hmm. I would leave home. My son was asleep. I would come home. My son was asleep. And at this time, uh, Pokemon had treated me really well. So I had a nice little nest egg and um, I just had, I, I said to myself, I got to figure out a way to make a living on Long Island. And uh, when I would talk to high school kids about, you know, uh, career paths, I would say to them, do whatever you're doing as long as you're having fun. And if you're not having fun, don't do it anymore. And I wasn't having fun. I, uh, and it wasn't that the job wasn't fun. I just wasn't having fun being away from my newborn. Right. So I just said, I got to figure, th- I got to figure out how to make a living in a different way. And yeah. uh, I just dropped the bomb on them, you know, caught them off guard, blindsided the, the, the company, um, you know, because there was no beef, right? There was no reason, mm-hmm. there was, no one would ever think that, you know, that I wanted to leave. But I just. But you had just such a valid excuse. I mean, that's yeah. that's the best reason to go. Family's always the, the right reason to go. 
Yeah, so. and you know, and being there at the beginning, I mean, literally, I was there at the beginning, you know, when when the, it all started because, you know, I mean, it was like thirty people, company wide. By the time I left, it was three hundred. That's crazy. It was it's, come on, that's crazy. And I know you because you do have such a business savvy mind. You did mention earlier that the downfall of four kids had something to do with television and what what do you, how do you see the decline happening like I, I know around 2008 obviously there was a financial crisis that so everyone took a hit yeah but then by then you, by then that by then it was over <laughs> yeah so what yeah. yeah how do you see it well the thing the thing about the word the licensing business as i mentioned the licensing business licensing business is driven by television um it it got to the point where if you don't have television if your property is not on TV, people were not buying in on it. So, so it became, that's why we ended up creating the Fox box. The Fox box was created because, uh, you know, uh, Nickelodeon had, uh, came into town, Cartoon Network came into town. So the, any, any new and fresh property would be gobbled up by, by uh, these networks that had TV. Mm -hmm. So we were missing out on on the hot stuff because we didn't have TV. So we here we were, the largest independent licensing company in the world, or you know, and all of a sudden we're not because we don't have television. So we create create the Fox Box. So now we had the Fox Box, and we tell people we have TV. So that kept us going for a while, but it was a twenty five million dollars a year nut that we had to cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then when the Fox, you know, uh. uh just as we let go of the Fox box and then it transferred over to, I, ki I think it was like kids WB, you mm -hmm. know, th there. Um, it's just not having access to television was killing the independent licensing company. So it wasn't just for kids. It was just any licensing company that did not have ac access to television. If I have a new cartoon, I'm going to Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. I'm going to mm -hmm. Disney. I'm going to Cartoon Network. I'm going to somebody who's going to put me in front of kids' eyes 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right, right. The whole structure yeah. was different. Yeah. So, so then you can, then you can't compete. So now, no matter if something is really hot, you're just not going to get it. Four kids was not getting the hot stuff because they didn't have television. So right. if you don't they have were the hot stuff. Trying to do chaotic that with the show chaotic, they tried to do it and it just didn't. It didn't hit. It's just a yeah. downward spiral. So it's yeah. a, it, it wasn't a matter of, of if, it was just when. Right. Because you just, the, the hot stuff, you know, the days where Pokemon, we were at the top of the heap w when Pokemon came about, and we made Pokemon happen because we had that connection. But the licensing business, I mean, the, the uh, syndication business was just went out the window with cable TV. It's like, there's no right. such thing. Cable TV killed licensing, um, uh, sorry. Um, syndication. Syndication. Yeah. So you can't syndicate as well anymore and you don't have the network and you're just not getting your hands on the good stuff. So now you're peddling middle of the road, B, C <laughs> level properties. Yeah. You're not getting the A stuff. Yeah. I, that's my opinion. So let me, you know, uh, put that little disclaimer on it. No, but of I course. Think it's, it's, a good, it's as good yeah. as any. Yeah, I mean, it, it does feel like you got out at the right time. So tell us what you did after that, leading up to your Emmy wins. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then we will let you get out of here. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, the one thing about about uh, being creative is is I love making stuff up. <laughs> I started mm -hmm. this conversation with making stuff up, and uh, you know, and right now, um, you know, I said to myself, what are my skill sets? What do I? What can I do that's going to make a difference in my community? So I um, I was a, a computer programmer. Um, I I knew broadcast TV um, when I wasn't. Working with um with for, uh, with Pokemon, I was working with the New York Daily News, second largest newspaper in the in the United States, doing bilingual publications about um like AIDS awareness, uh, uh, Kwanzaa, Women's History Month. So I really got into the philosophy of doing news, a uh, positive news about the community and people making a difference. Mm -hmm. So I just took all you know my nest egg and I said I'm going to create an online news channel. Um, and I'm only going to focus on the people making a difference in our community. At the huh, time, it, that was 2006. Uh, uh, YouTube had just been purchased by by um, by Google, so um, YouTube was like a place for goofy kids to do stuff. I said, you know that <laughs> that YouTube, if you put real 
significant stories on YouTube, adults will watch. That was what I said in 2006 when everybody was just, it was like the TikTok back then. Right, right. And, and then um, uh, uh, Verizon saw what I was doing on, you, on YouTube. Um, they, they gave me a contract. I was uh, creating 156 half hour magazines a year for Verizon. Um, and I was on broadcast TV, a million plus people watching. And, you know, a bunch of awards and Emmys and, and, uh, and it was fun. And, and I just love the fact that I made up that job. Yeah. Yeah. You created a whole opportunity for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I wasn't afraid of, of uh, pro, uh, creating stuff. Uh, I created my own website. Um, I, uh, I, I had a, a YouTube clone, a, 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 a website that was a clone of YouTube. Um, and I wasn't afraid because I knew programming and I wasn't afraid because I knew broadcasting and, um, and I love my community. So to this day, um, that that's really what I've been doing since 2004, 2006, just telling stories about people that make a difference in our community. And I wrap up with this, uh, because I'm a Bronx boy, when I would travel all over the world on behalf of Pokemon, people would be looking for my bullet wounds <laughs> or... <laughs> Oh my. you said Bronx. I'm That's a Bronx it. Boy. That's all they heard. And then, yeah. So, so <laughs> I, I, you know, I just felt that the Bronx had a bad reputation and, uh, and I moved to uh, Brentwood, Long Island, which is essentially the Bronx of Long Island. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, for me, it's beautiful. I love it. But, you know, a lot of people, you know, because it's a predominantly Hispanic community um, and, you know, it's just uh, viewed a little bit differently, not like the Hamptons. So I, I just wanted to put, um, you know, our people and, and our communities in a positive light and showing what, you know, what a Hispanic and a black kid is doing um, that it's not being arrested or, you know, or, or some just something negative. The, the only reason the news, uh, the news ever shows up to our communities. And, you know, well, you mentioned, you know, out. leaving the job because of your son. And I think what you are doing now is the best thing that he can yeah. see you doing. You yeah. know, as exciting as Pokemon is, what you're doing now is is just so important. So that's that's awesome. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And you know, and I'm I'm doing things that matter. You know, I I, I would love to be able to give millions of dollars <laughs> to to charities, but I'm able to give my creativity. You know, so mm -hmm. just recently, uh, Island Harvest, which um, feeds the homeless. I mean, not the homeless, feeds p uh, families uh, who are, have food insecurity. They asked mm -hmm. me to do a PSA for them. I did. You know. Uh, it, 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 thinking like what Norman did for me, you know, yeah. I just did a really uh, amazing <laughs> PSA for them. And, you know, Aww. I saved them you're thousands of dollars. You're paying it forward. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's awesome. You're, you're, thank you so much for talking to us. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're welcome. I'm sure we'll come up with a lot more questions. And you guys at home, I, I know you couldn't see what he was showing us, but we will figure out a way to, so that you can see it on our website and stuff. Thank you so much, Waldo. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. We got some questions answered. <laughs> always, <laughs> always, lo always love when that happens. But uh, wow, what a what a what a what a good what a what a great interview there. What uh, a great guy. Yeah, yeah. and I, I mean, amazing memory. Yeah, I think you know, kind of you know, when you're working in visual art like that. I, you kind of have to have that kind of memory, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know. Like, do you <laughs> just, think I, you, like no, no, I, I want to follow that up. Like, do you think visual artists have more of a photographic memory than other non? I know. I artists? definitely do. I, yeah, I do not. It's weird. I, I, I have that, but also like, you know, and, and, you know, with this show too, like I will distinct, I, I'll, I have not, I was just actually, uh, some behind the scenes stuff before this episode, I just so happened like, oh, I wanted to rewatch like some of the episodes on the uncut Yu-Gi-Oh DVD. But then I was also watching the original uh, dubs, you know, episodes oh, too. Okay. And I was remembering line reads like, like it was nothing. Like I rem like distinctly remember them so well. Um, That's how your brain works. Yeah, just, my brain yeah. does not work like that. <laughs> but it makes for, you good at your job. But for it's, um. You know, for such a creative guy working in such a creative field and a very creative position at Four Kids, like such a wealth of knowledge there. And and for yeah. me, like great trip down memory lane. Unfortunately, this is an audio podcast. 
Uh, so you yeah. can see, like, he'd be pulling up some stuff. Like, he pulled up a Pokemon poster with the original 150. And I'm like, I remember kids that yeah, had those Yeah, posters, after, the, it, after we stopped, he remembered he had this poster. But mm-hmm. we, we, I asked him to take a picture with it. So, again, hopefully we'll have some screenshots and stuff to go along with this episode. Because that... Yu-Gi-Oh sketch, man. I want to see that's, those Yu-Gi-Oh sketches. That's such a great story. That's such a... I, <laughs> what I love about yeah. the show is finding, you know, the, you know, these interesting backstories to some of the choices or just, you know, some, you know, the creative decisions that went into these productions. But, like, what's also great about this podcast is just, like, these, these only in New York kind of stories. Yeah. Well, it, I also... All this stuff that was happening pre-internet, like, the fact that mm-hmm. he loved that font... Found the guy again. Like these were not Googleable things. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, maybe he knew somebody who knew somebody. But again, this was there was so much legwork that went into this stuff. Yeah. I mean, with Google, I have trouble finding the right people to interview. So imagine just the, the speed at which they were working, finding these people, and that is the Yu Gi Oh font that you all see, Yu Gi Oh font and logo that you all see in your heads right to, now. When you're to this day, to this. you know. Yeah. And the and the respect from one artist to another to actually get in contact with them and purchase like the rights, you know, yep. to use mm-hmm. it, you know, and that's uh in this day and age with AI and all this other bullshit, uh... you know, I I can't help but respect that. And the fact yeah. that, you know, he has a bunch of his family members all working. I love studio. all of that. And and I mean <laughs> the forty Cabrera is so but and the and just how much good he did. I, I you know I said to him after the interview that hearing those good stories like Norman making that video for those kids, it really humanizes mm-hmm. a corporation. Yeah, you know, it really puts a nice face to all that stuff. So all for for all of the people who are angry to also hear about all that good stuff going on behind the scenes is so cool. And the truth is, is I'm sure we all. I don't know if I'm in that. I don't know if he knows if he has it or not, but. We all said yes to stuff like that. We would have never asked to be paid for anything. You know, we all do as much Mm -hmm. stuff for good as we can. You know, I don't know. I can't imagine maybe a couple people wouldn't. No, I'm just joking. Uh, We all would have said yes to something like that. So it's cool to hear how it was received because we didn't always hear the other side of it. I think like, you know, and that was... And, you know, and that must have been an era where, you know, not everyone was going to conventions or, you know. No, there was no, you can get a cameo. Yeah. You you know, no cameos or any (laughs) of that stuff. And, you know, maybe to hear these familiar characters say your name. Yeah, I think I even, yeah, I would have gone crazy for that as well. So that was such a neat little caveat. And I said, like, I was like, that wouldn't happen today because I think now it's like all these companies are so protective IPs. Of voices and, yes. You can't just go around saying, I'm this character saying this. And we've brushed, I think we've even talked about this in some other episodes, too, as well. And, and, you know, it's a choice thing, too. But I think some companies, like, you can't go around saying you're this character saying this. Right. We so can't, that, yeah. Or they have a specific department you have to go through if it's right. for charitable work and then you have red tape but like sure we can do it no problem just get all of this signed and dotted and (laughs) notarized and yeah all right on that note what a (laughs) awesome guy thank you so much to waldo Mm -hmm. uh and uh we'll be back next week with more interview fun (laughs) and what else (laughs) i'm i'm looking forward to more interview fun uh, oh, I was waiting for you to use your catchphrase. I'm, I was I'm building. You in. I'm. I'm kind of setting You're myself up. You're building it up. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying. Okay, like, how? Okay, I'm. I'm r- trying to roll with you here. What should I? Okay. Go, wow, go Tara, for it. interview fun. <laughs> I can't wait. Listen, my stomach is growling. I'm so hungry. We'll That's catch why. you next time. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Four Kids Flashback is a production of Maji Media, hosted by Tara Sands and Steve Yurko. Producers are Zach Logan, Tara Sands, and Steve Yurko. For more information, go to fourkidsflashback.com. That is the number four. And if you worked at Four Kids and have a story you want to share, please email us at fourkidsflashback at gmail.com. You can find us on social media at Four Kids Flashback. And to listen early and ad free, head to patreon.com slash fourkidsflashback. For podcast merchandise, find links on our website and link tree. As they say on every podcast, if you liked this show, please subscribe, rate, and review, and tell your friends, or four. 
If you want to check out other Maji Media podcasts, go to Maji, M-A-J-I, dot media. Thanks for listening.